All right. Hey, folks. Welcome. I think the folks are getting into the room here. My name's Liberty, and um, I'm, uh, I guess, facilitating on behalf of Firestorm Books and Coffee in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, this is mm, our fifth or sixth uh, Zoom-based um, author event, and so it's still a little bit of an experiment, and I appreciate you all being willing to um, give it a shot with us. Uh, the last few have been really awesome, and I think tonight's also going to be great. So we are just so excited uh, to have with us tonight um, Julia Feliz and uh, Zane McNeil, who um, are going to be uh, sharing uh, some of the content and maybe a little bit about the process um, that went into a new book that just came out recently, um, Queer and Trans uh, Voices, um, and uh, that subtitle being uh, Achieving Liberation Through Consistent uh, Anti-Oppression. So if you aren't already familiar uh, with uh, Sanctuary Publishers, Sanctuary is a really amazing project, which I'm sure we'll get to hear a little bit more about tonight, that has put out just a series of stellar books that are, I think, really essential. And I say that as someone who is um, uh, a longtime vegan and also uh, someone who's trans. Um, and works at a bookstore, which is uh, both ally aligns itself with uh, veganism, animal liberation, and uh, the queer community. So this is an intersection that is like really near and dear to us, um, and for which there's really been just kind of a dearth of accessible material, um, which is something that maybe we'll talk about a little bit tonight. But let me just say a little bit about the format, and then I'm going to turn it away and stop talking. Um, so the way this is going to work is. Um, we're going to hear from Zane and Julia to get started, um, a little introduction, um, a reading from the book, um, and then we'll transition over into more of a question and answer discussion. Um, I've got a few prepared questions that I'll share, but we'll definitely want to hear from y'all as participants. Uh, the way that's going to work um, to kind of like keep things tidy, uh, we've got anyone who's not speaking is muted presently. Um, and uh, what we'll do is there's actually, you can uh, raise your hand um, in the Zoom software uh, if you are wanting to speak. The other option would be to drop a comment into the chat. Um, so poke around if you haven't used Zoom before, uh, but uh, you can indicate uh, your interest in speaking in whatever way works for you, raising your virtual hand or dropping a comment in the box. Um, and then we will unmute you so that you can ask your question, or if for any reason you don't want your voice to be um, part of this recorded event, uh, you're welcome to just fully type that question or comment into the, the chat box and I'll be happy to read it on your behalf. Um, so yeah, um, I don't wanna spend too much more time talking here, uh, just to say that if you aren't already familiar with Firestorm, we are a 12 year old, uh, cooperative based in Asheville um, here on occupied Cherokee land. Um, and uh, we were started in 2008 as a project to provide community space with a cooperative model um, influenced heavily by anarchism and the principles of uh, direct democracy. Uh, so we welcome you here tonight and we're just really pleased to be able to facilitate this conversation despite all the, the challenging circumstances. So that's all I've got for the moment. Um, Julie and Zane, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for I having us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so Julie, you wanna go first? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction. Um, thank you for having us. And um, my name is Julia Feliz. I am an afro Boricua. Um, and I am currently in Florida. I just moved back a few months ago from Switzerland. And I started um, Sanctuary Publishers in 2017 from nothing. <laughs> like, I just basically registered it. I was basically most of my projects and everything that I do is usually born out of frustration with um, racism or some other type of depression. And that's basically how Sanctuary Publishers came to be. And we now have um, eight books, and there are more in the works. And we're also translating um, a lot of the books into Spanish. 
and hopefully other languages eventually. Um, we're really, really grassroots, and um, I really appreciate um, the support that we've received from Fire Schoolum. And when I say we, I mean we. I mean, I mean, I, I mean. When I say we, I mean I, because uh, I run everything. <laughs> it's literally like me trying to keep up with the emails and everything. Um, and but I'm also grateful to all the authors and the designer that I work with, and because um, literally um, everyone who is involved or has been involved basically took a chance on Thank Your Publishers. So, um, and I'm really grateful for that, and um, I'm grateful for this opportunity for um, for basically raising um, my voice and, and giving us um, a platform. So thank you for that. And I'm grateful for Zane um, and all the, the work that, that has gone um, into uh, Queer and Trans Voices. Um, Zane? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so uh, extremely proud of this collection. Um, a little about me, I'm a 10-year vegan. I turned vegetarian when I was 11. <laughs> uh, and so it's been a, a long road for me for sure. I actually used to go to Asheville and Firestorm in particular when I was in high school because it was, you know, Asheville was supposed to be this vegan utopia. <laughs> uh, and so I used to go once every year and I just absolutely loved it. Uh, so it's really great to be with Firestorm right now. Um, so I am from West Virginia. I currently reside in Baltimore, and then I have a lot of different research interests. So partially because I myself am like a trans queer person, and obviously a vegan, that was a, this is a personal collaborative project. But I also was trained as a historian, and in oral histories, I think there's a lot of power to be able to um, provide a platform to get folks who have been historically marginalized and not been able to gain access um, to it to get their voices heard um, and so with this project in particular and a lot of my other projects I see myself as a facilitator to be able to use the privilege I have to be able to create a platform for these folks and I'm just so excited uh, for all the contributors who have been part of it and it's been a really amazing project and Julia's of course is just a firecracker they do everything <laughs> um it's been really fun to be able to work with them awesome so um julia would you want to start right off with sharing a passage from the book yes um i wanted to read uh one of the essays um by um an essay by Lori Kim Alexander, and I actually spoke with her today, which was awesome. She helped me do some grounding, um, and it's she's one of the most incredible people I've ever met. Um, she's when you think activist and like badass, and <laughs> like nonstop, um, and just powerful like Lori Kim is just uh, I I I've actually met her um in person which was amazing and and just her her persona her the way that she carries herself and it's just oh um it's hard for me to describe and I admire her so much and and she's so strong and she's been vegan for 25 years and that was also really amazing to me. So um, the, her essay is titled, Is Your Memory Long Enough for the Road Ahead? The Problem with Inclusion. Don't include me. Don't include us. We, trans, non-binary, and queer, black, and brown people have been here. We've been here in all movement spaces and in all the creations of movement philosophies whether cis and straight people like it or not, and whether they have been able to reconcile this with their idea of what our liberation movements should look like, or the history they've been mistold, we've been here. We've been here even when the LGBTQIA movements remain centered and focused on white trans and queer people. We've been here fighting for non-human animal rights in the vegan movement. We've also been here fighting for black liberation. 
So speaking about including trans and queer black and brown people in the LGBTQIA plus movement spaces and in vegan spaces is an insulting joke. But let's step back a bit and look at our liberation movement in a more holistic way. Movement work is the movement work is the way in which we push back and through the colonization of Earth and its being. The name itself means action and implies fluidity. Let us think of liberation movements. They're movements that work against the oppression of marginalized bodies as we think of biodiversity. Biodiversity is not the whole collection of beings on Earth going about their daily business with no thought for any other species around them. What makes the ecosystem which sustain us work are the symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationships and networks of connections which run deep and are inextricably linked. These relationships are vital to the survival of the individuals within them. When we remove one tiny piece of this framework, we herald the collapse of systems. As each system breaks down, the entire earth begins to crumble. For instance, gopher tortoises are long-living burrowing reptiles found in the south southeastern uh, United States. They can burrow down up to roughly 50 feet. They spend most of their lives in these burrows. Their burrows are key habitats for over 350 species. The gopher tortoise is currently on the endangered species list and threatened with extinction because of habitat loss. Many of the species of snakes, insects, frogs, and birds like the burrowing owl that also use gopher tortoise burrows are either threatened or critically endangered as well. Gopher tortoises are very territorial, so how, do they, how is it that they can allow these animals into their spaces? These are mutually beneficial relationships as the animals find shelter and help protect the gopher tortoises who are vegan as well, by the way. Thinking about spaces that claim to be focused on liberation, we see that none of the systems of oppression are disconnected. They all stem from the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy that is both the spawn of an impetus for colonialism. Book um, 2004. So how is it that we expect that liberation will come without a clear and consistent centering of the most marginalized and affected by these systems across species? True, anti-oppression work is abolition work. In our movements for Black Lives, we have pledged to center the most marginalized Black people, but we're forgetting the Black people who have lost limbs and lives in the slaughterhouses, chicken farms, and other extensions of the state-sanctioned carceral systems. Within movements, we must contentiously and persistently think about the ways in which we, black and brown people, as a wholly marginalized yet global majority, contribute to the marginalization and subjugation of other beings and are also oppressed by them. Queer liberation spaces, unless they are specifically created by people of color, have historically faltered in centering black, indigenous, and other people of color, and have also never thought to expand their notion of what marginalized bodies mean to include non-human animals. Not in any larger sense. If we include veganism, it is as a dietary restriction for the humans in these spaces, not as a point of practice for a liberatory tool. In vegan spaces, we often claim to center non-human species. However, centering animals means decentering ourselves without losing ourselves in that process. Yet, even in vegan spaces, we're routinely centering animals by anthropomorphizing them. This means we're using human models for the emotions, actions, and intentions of non-human animals. We do not know how to center them without first speaking to ourselves as a model. That needs work. This will mean detaching ourselves from our misconceptions that cloud our understanding. And family, we are cloudy. We have been made so by hundreds of years of misconceptions that have seeped into, in so deep that routing out, them out feels like ripping out an organ. They were never ours though, ma'am. So when we work to center trans and queer, black, indigenous, and other people of color within the liberatory practice of veganism, this cannot be done without the input of trans and queer, black, indigenous, and other people of color. In fact, it has to be done by trans and queer, black, indigenous, and people of color. The same is true for LGBTQI movement in spaces. Don't come to us and say you want to be inclusive, intersectional, and celebrate diversity if you don't come to us first before you create these spaces don't include me. Create the space with us in mind. You follow our lead. Hell, uno, do this and everything else? In fashion, mannerisms, language, liberation, trends, and 
queer black and brown people gave you the vanguard. The year 2019 marked the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising in Greenwich Village in Manhattan, New York. The Stonewall was a bar that was created for white gay men. It was a space that routinely excluded any black and brown folk, especially trans and gender non-conforming folk. But that fateful night at the Stonewall was drag night, so all the folks could get in, some with a little struggle, but we digress. That night was the night that Miss Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Storm, Lee De La, De La Verie, and other BIPOC had enough of the police pushing them around. They fought back. They fought for their lives. And because of them, the white, trans, and queer folk were moved to action too. When you look at the photos of the now veterans of the uprising and those who were forward in the early organizations that are birthed, they're mostly white. Very few black and brown people remain alive, and the ones who are still here are rarely mentioned by any larger media outlets or far-reaching organizations. This year, Marsha, Sylvia, and Stormy, our black and brown ancestors, were invoked over and over by white voices. However, the substantive truth of um, black and trans queer lives was never included in these sound bites. This is the truth of the occupied reality we live in, where claims only in death yet the violence of that death is not connected to the structures in place which caused it and perpetuate the privilege of claiming us. Marsha P. Johnson was murdered and found floating in the Hudson. As I write this, news outlets have designated 2019 the deadliest year for trans women. And we must remain cognizant of the fact that Black, Brown, and Indigenous women have been and continue to be murdered at disproportionately higher rates than their white trans counterparts. This year is also momentous because it marks 400 years since the first documented slaver ship touched down in what is now known as Virginia in the United States. This is before the Mayflower. Of all the 600,000 Africans who were enslaved and survived the imaginable violence of the Middle Passage, of all the 12 million African, Africans whose bodies were commodified and brutalized throughout the diaspora were non-identifiable to us, as what we now call LGBT, LGBTQIA+. Knowing the thousands of years of documented trans and queer li uh, lives across African continental cultures, we know the truth. That all the slave re revolts, culture, teaching, code-creating spirit, and conjure working music in a way uh, making could not have been done without some trans and queer involvement. A true and committed biodiversity of movement with the most marginalized of us at the center in the lead, not just fodder for the front line, but in the lead, can fix the disconnect between sound bites and performance. This can give those of us marginalized by the systemic state sanctioned violence of the prison industrial complex, police, politicized borders, and factory farming a true voice. That said, what good is centering of the spaces in which we are centered or hostile, hostile unwittingly? so or not. It is important that time and effort be put into education and acknowledgement of privileges and all that come with them be done by those who hold the most societal, societal power so that the full burden of the spaces we lead and grow in isn't put on those of us who we wish to center. That includes analyzing the ways in which we view non-humans. Marginalized folks also need spaces that are ours alone. This is not the antecedent anti-thesis of inclusion. Instead, it facilitates healing and community in the ways we need to make our movements thrive. The recognition of the intensely magical connections of our network of liberation movements is the only way for us to survive. We were brought to this pivotal moment in history by the audacity of a perception of superiority. The way forward is not a counter, but a destination of that perception with the audacity of mindful action. We're driven not by simple compassion, but by compulsion to bring everybody with, with us. My future then is defiantly black, defiantly queer, radically vegan, and absolutely will never be made through good intention. So one of the um, amazing experiences that I had with Laura Kim is um, we actually uh, went to Stonewall together, and um, she, she spoke to me about her experiences, um, which are hers to tell, I won't talk about them, but um, one of the, the, the reasons why Lori Kim is, is really amazing to me, and it might be really odd to you, but it's because she's the first 
um, in black, uh, or even POC um, that I've ever met that actually works also as a biologist. Um, my background is in um, conservation and ecology. And when I first met her and she told me that she was actually, um, you know, she did work it as a biologist, it was just, like, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was like, wow, another person? Like, another <laughs> PLC? <laughs> like, um, but then neither of us actually work in it because finding jobs is pretty much impossible. Um, so that's also another reason why I'm, and just basically she's an incredible person. Um, and yeah, and, and I hope that, that everyone takes the time to, to really think about the word and what really needs to happen um, for things to actually change within the DGM movement, but also within the LGBTQI plus um, movement as well. Um, do you want to say anything about about that? There was one more other thing that I wanted to mention, but um, can't think of it right now. So, oh, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what's so impactful about Lori Kim's piece. Because when we do the the book previews, we get to pick a few chapters, and we pick Lori Kim's the introduction, and then Leah Kurtz who did the piece on anti carceral veganism, and I think that exemplified what this collection is. Because what is so powerful about consistent anti oppression work is that it's really recognizing how all these systems of domination are connected, and so you can't be do a single. Um, issue activism, right? There's so many different organizations and movements that, like many vegan organizations, are very single issue. It's, it's always the animals, but I don't think you recognize that it's, it's never just the animals. What's so powerful about food justice and vegan activism is how it connects to so many different movements. You know, you have, and we can fight against environmental racism, you know, you can fight uh, for workers' rights because working in a slaughterhouse is one of the most dangerous jobs in the country. And a component of that is also working for the rights of immigrants, um, in addition to non-human animals. And so queer um, and vegan politics are so integral to who I am and the way I perceive the world, because I think it offers a framework to do truly revolutionary change. And the authors and contributors we have in this book really illustrate that. You know, they, they're doing abolition work. You know, they are talking about white supremacy in vegan spaces. They're talking about, you know, why people who are so radical in so many different other ways ignore non-humans and why that really does a disservice to ourselves as well. And so I, why I'm so proud of this piece, and, and I love Lori Kim's, is because it really does get to the heart of everything is so inexorably connected that you can't dissect it and just care about one part of an identity or one system because it is all structural and it is all interconnected. So the, I remember what I wanted to say, and it's actually the, the sentence where she, she says, um, marginalized folks also need spaces that are ours alone. The very first time that I met Lori Kim in person was actually a farm sanctuary. She had been waiting 25 years to go there. Um, and it was, amazing um it was my first time there too uh, we, i hosted the veganism of color conference which is you can actually um, watch it on uh, veganismofcolor.com and it was so powerful it was just oh i indescribable to me um and then i find out <laughs> that someone filed a complaint against me to the Division of Human Rights for discrimination <laughs> because um, it was an event um, specifically for vegans of color. So, um, yeah. So, 
I just want wanted to to note that and that basically the the this idea of everything you hear now is diversity inclusion diversity inclusion um but we've you know black brown indigenous people have been always have been here like Lori Kim says and it's it's completely offensive um to sort of be an afterthought that suddenly we have to be included but then what does that even mean um when you include us what does that mean because does that mean that we're given um the same access does it mean that we have the same um rights as um the, the non-POC to make decisions? Does it mean that we're able to sort of go off um, and do our own thing? And the answer to all those questions is no, because even when there's this diversity and inclusion, we're still, we're still expected to perform. Um, and, and basically not what we need. It, 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 when I think, myself and others a lot um when we have these conversations and i think every time i actually think of like this idea of inclusion and diversity i know that that it's basically performative <laughs> organizing <laughs> yeah um so i know to actually stay away from it but it's so um integral now to to this idea of oh, that's what we need to do um when it isn't and basically everything that I, that I know I've learned from, from um, Black Indigenous um, people and um, specifically Black women. And when she writes about we need to center the marginalized, that's, that's what we need to do. Um, and it's a little bit complicated within the vegan movement because the 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 beings that we're speaking up for are um, basically our victims. <laughs> They're the ones that we oppress. So, so even within veganism, when pe vegans claim that they're centering um, non-human animals, it's, it's really not true. What's happening is the centering of the most privileged. Um, and that's also something that, that um, we need to think about what sensory means um, depending on, on the movement itself. I, uh, a few years ago, I saw a comic um, that was about the life cycle of a Black woman going into an NGO, right? And then her ideas are appropriated, she is talked down upon, underpaid, used for free labor, right and then she exits the organization and everyone's like what do we do wrong <laughs> you know because so many of these these organizations especially with the nonprofit industrial complex are completely ingrained in active and unconscious white supremacy and that's really not challenged and that's something the vegan movement uh, has not really embattled themselves with yet so you can hear a lot of different organizations saying that they, they do, they do have calls for inclusivity and then for diversity, and then they don't understand why queer and trans people of color aren't there. And it's not because queer and trans people of color aren't vegan, aren't doing the work. They like they lead every movement, right? But I mean, think of all the ideas that have been taken from you, Julia, right? And then you might not be paid for them and you won't be reimbursed for your labor and then someone else will get those accolades and move up in the organization. Uh, and that's really what you see reflected. So when you've, especially recently with all these animal welfare organizations coming out for black lives, that's great, it's wonderful, but it can't be performative. You know, what are you actually doing? And I think we have, like I was saying before, veganism is so such a great social justice movement because it's interconnected to everything. You can work with uh, like pride organizations, you can work with workers' rights organizations, environmental organizations, community leaders, and other activists. But when you're doing single issue work, 
that is inherently a component of white supremacy. And you're not just doing the organization and yourself at a service, but also the work you want to be doing for animals. Thank you for sharing those comments. I, I think that what's really powerful about this book is that um, it shows these interconnections um, between uh, vegan movements um, and uh, queer movements, um, both in terms of like how they both um, are combating the same forms of domination, but also how I think both of them, um, uh, particularly in the United States, which is my context, I imagine in lots of other places as well, are really mired in the same failures. And so I think it's there's value not only in uh, being able to see that there's like sort of a, a common enemy um, or a common system of domination, you know, our kind of like overarching like white supremacist patriarchal system of domination. But in addition, I think the fact that both um, the animal rights movement and LGBT like movements have so consistently fallen down in the same mm -hmm. ways um, and are both so captured by the same nonprofit industrial complex that I think that's a really powerful intersection to be aware of as well. And I think that this piece that you just shared, Julia, is like, um, is just wonderful at like, at like bringing us back to that. Um, can I, can I ask you all a question about the book, um, kind of like in kind of its, its, uh, its point of origin? Mm -hmm. um, I guess, uh, so as, as a queer vegan, of course, I'm very excited that there is a book about queer veganism, but I can imagine that for some people, the idea of queer veganism even being a thing to be theorized could be kind of like a bit novel, like, oh, that's interesting. Like, huh, wonder what you could do with that. Um, and I guess I'm curious, particularly because there isn't a lot of accessible material on queer veganism. Like, right, if you want to read about um, animal liberation and feminism, there's there's a fair amount of content out there at this point. Um, but queer veganism, I feel like there's a little less of, and I, I'm curious, how did, how did y'all arrive at the point of knowing that this book was needed? So this has uh, been a passion project for me for a good while. Um, so a little bit about me is I went to a master's degree pr a program abroad. So I went to Budapest, Hungary, and I was a political science student but I really fell into gender studies there. And that's the first time I got to learn about like queer ecologies and then queer theory. And that's also like when I came out to myself as well, you know, um, abroad and through those, those works, the way it framed, it just connected with me. That's how I saw myself and my body and the world around me and how it was all inherently politicized. And so I have been into ecofeminist work really my whole life. My, my mom was an ecofeminist, you know, raised me on, on really great theorists. Um, but I'd never really connected the two until I was abroad and I was like, this is something that inherently connects to me. And around, this is a little bit different, but around the same time, that's also when Queer Appalachia Zine came out. And that's the first time I saw myself in a publication, you know, that I read people's words and I was like, that's me, you know, and that was such an empowering moment um, that I've been thinking about how, how many other people who are queer, who are vegan, who understand the intersections and the politics of this are out there. Because when you think of the people doing the most work, especially like my friends, like we're all queer, right? Because I feel like as, as queer folks, we recognize what it's like, uh, how systems of oppression are interconnected and how we have that in common with other systems of oppression, right? So the not saying that the same as non-human animals, but we recognize and empathize with that we're both oppressed by the same structure. And so, I really loved the work that Sanctuary Publishers had been putting out, um, and I really love their mission that it all goes back to the community. It goes, it goes back to vegans of color. It's, it's a very community-oriented project. Um, and so I reached out to Julia and, and pitched the idea. And it was, it was kind of funny. I, <laughs> I got th thrown through a, a few hoops, but it was, uh, <laughs> we were so fast because I mean, most publications will take years right especially in that thinking like academic publishing we did this i pitched april it got published this year in april it was a one-year turnaround working with all these wonderful contributors 
And it, you know, it took, so, like, for me, that's so long. <laughs> I know, that's what you say. <laughs> a year, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, like, well, the, the mission of, of Sanctuary Publishers has always been to raise the voices of uh, marginalized communities. And um, my journey um, to my own queerness and transness has been <laughs> like I didn't come out till um 35 30, 36 um and when Zane approached me um basically I I was suspect <laughs> um so I kind of tested them hard <laughs> I'm really neurodivergent and um, I communicate better um, in writing, but uh, which is why I'm I talk like this. But but when I communicate in writing, I'm so pointed is the word <laughs> direct and to the point, and I know that I can't work with someone who cannot handle it. So just from that initial email, I was like. <laughs> Get it all out there. And uh Zane responded. <laughs> so I was like, okay, maybe this is okay. Um and I really like uh love the idea, especially um just recognizing that um the the similarities in, in I'll say in the failures of both movements mm -hmm. and and it was really a project that, that um, I could believe in and I, I wanted to do, um, especially if it meant centering the voices of um, Black, Brown, Indigenous um, people of color that have, um, you know, that have been part of history and part of our story now. So um, I'm grateful that that Zane reached out and that we were able to do this and it would have been done faster, but I had some other stuff to do. <laughs> a year is so fast. A year is so fast. <laughs> but I call that like my ADHD superpower. And I'm just like, oh, mm -hmm. just done. Yeah, we both, done. I'm very much propelled by anxiety. So I have a ton of projects all the time. So we worked really well together. Cause like when we were both like on, we would just get shit done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad I'm glad it it, uh, it worked out, um, and that we were able to do it, and especially that we were able to to raise the voices of, of uh, mm -hmm. people like Lori Kim, who basically recognition is like long overdue. Mm -hmm. and, and one, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. And and one cool component is um, I was able to pitch kind of. A, a listicle piece to Veg News, and I really got to bring folks that have been margin actively politically marginalized. Right? It's not because they're not doing the work; it's because our our movements and our publications very much center white voices, right? White normative voices. Um, and so you hear the same vegans all the time, right? The popular vegans who are not doing the most work and are really taking up space. And so I felt incredibly privileged to be able to uh, write about the accomplishments of a lot of our contributors in a publication like Veg News that has a huge circulation. Yeah, that was really special, um, especially seeing people that, that that have been doing the work and working really hard and, and basically, and not that any of us like need the recognition, um, and I think that's the part that's so special that that we'll, we'll be doing the work, like um, all these people will still be doing the work no matter what. <laughs> but I'll pay I them. <laughs> yeah, so gonna, start yeah. paying trans people and queer people of color, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as, as I like read through the book, um, something that jumped out at me very quickly was that both of y'all, I think, um, are, and, and all the other contributors too, um, are very deliberate about language. Um, so something that I would love to hear from y'all is um, 
and, and I think, in fact, a lot of people who are picking this book up maybe might encounter terms and phrasing that might be new to them. Um, uh, you know, like write off, um, you know, uh, terms like uh, BIPOC, um, marginalized genders. I mean, even the fact that the title itself includes the term um, consistent anti-oppression. Um, these are kind of nuanced terms that um, I'm hoping that you can say a little bit about um, kind of what the value in using precise language is uh, for queer vegans? Um, I am, I don't know how to say this. <laughs> I basically um, do not let uh, white vegans use the term intersectionality around me or in anything that I publish. Um, and the word appears in my my book, a Veganism in a Oppressive World, from 2017. But um, it came to the point where the word basically has been destroyed. <laughs> um, and where like white vegans were calling themselves like intersectional or saying that that the, the term applied to them and um, that they were intersectional vegans or are. Um, except they weren't censoring um, black, um, brown or indigenous um, uh, women or um, people of marginalized genders. And, and to me that signals um, a huge problem. And I think it started in academia because I've had this conversation uh, with some of my, my friends um, that are professors and, and scholars. And, they are now at this point, um, I guess, starting to think about, hey, maybe we didn't use the right term, <laughs> or maybe this word has been used to the point that it it has lost um, its meaning. So, so I, I am. That really fast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, just some background. Intersectionality is it was a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a legal scholar, and she coined that term um, for a case about discrimination saying that it's it's not just you can't black women particularly are not just discriminated for a being black or being a woman it's because they are black and a woman and so not only is it part of like critical race theory uh, and legal scholarship but it is a theory created specifically for women of color um i don't remember what i was Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> ADHD. <laughs> no uh, you talk about um, you coining consistent anti-oppression. Oh yeah. So when when I was working, um, so I was frustrated with the movement. But then um, I basically stopped um, sharing spaces that had uh, white vegans in them for a while, and I completely threw myself into um, POC only spaces and I noticed um, you know I, I got to, to, to learn um, quickly the, the reasons why and of course it was like white vegans blah 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 um, so then I started sort of it, it's been like this whole journey for me of, of uh, I'm older and I'm from a culture where um, Basically, I, I shoved my identity way down deep and <laughs> it stayed there for a long time because it's just not safe or, or um, it's still taboo or whatever. Um, so as I was thinking about all these interconnections, um, I finally recognized that intersectionality, of course, was, was being misused. And what the movement and um, the different movements needed was um, a way to recognize that it's all interconnected. Um, and, and, and consistent anti-oppression became um, a term um, that I hoped um, would be clear enough um, to basically um, invoke the idea that you can't work um, towards one issue but not the other. You have to be consistent 
in, in across all movements if you want to really um, take down um, the system that basically um, created this problem, or not a problem, but um, that is basically responsible for, for um, the oppression of marginalized people. Um, so that's where the, the idea came from and why I'm so um, intentional in, in um, the terms that are used, for example, in, in, in the book. And uh, I think that um, I have a, a reputation <laughs> that I'm kind of a pain to work with because uh, I'm like, nope, nope, can't use that word, no, nope, no. Nope. And this is why. And of course, like I have to educate and, and explain and stuff. Um, but yeah, um, it's funny that, that you picked that out. <laughs> yeah, because discourse is, is very intentional, right? And so one thing that that Julia was able to do with our contributors is during the editorial process did the labor of actually explaining why discourse matters and why some terms are were more fit than others um, and that was very much a dialogic experience between them and the contributors Thank you all so much for commenting on that. So I'll, I'll throw one more thought out. Um, and, and this has already been touched on, um, but the book does feature um, a really uh, fantastic piece by um, Leah Kurtz uh, on uh, carceral veganism and abolitionism. Um, and that piece did also really jump out for me. And I think particularly because so many of us are having conversations about abolitionism in the context of the current uprising uh, for Black Lives and against policing. Um, and I, I thought it was just really fantastic to open a book on queer veganism and find um, space dedicated to unpacking like carceral society. Um, and, and of course the, the piece I think really makes a strong case for why, why it's so important uh, for vegans um, to be anti-carceral. Uh, but I guess um, I'm curious if, um, if y'all would be willing to share a little bit about um, the kind of like anti-carceral queer vegan um, themes that are present in that piece or run through the book and maybe like what they offer in this present moment where so many people are being exposed to um, prison and police abolition for the first time. Uh, and I think people, particularly white people, right, who, who have not previously done this work and have not, have not read and explored these ideas that are overwhelmingly theorized and put forward uh, by um, black and queer and brown folks. Um, yeah, what, what, where, does, where does the queer veganism fit in in this moment? I would say, I'm um, going back to the idea of consistent anti-oppression, right? You can't be vegan and be pro-police, <laughs> right? As an inherent system of violence, you can't be vegan and pro-incarceration. Um, just like you shouldn't be fighting for queer liberation and ignoring non-human animals. And that's really the point this collection was trying to drive home, mm -hmm. is that it, it is all structurally connected. Uh, I love Leah's piece. I think it, it's super impactful especially since so many uh, vegan organizations, animal welfare organizations have very close relationships with uh, police. And especially when you see um, organizations that try to market uh, anti-cruelty cases, right, as a fundraising technique. So you'll see, you know, someone had injured a dog and they'll throw that everywhere and be like, you need to throw that person in jail. Or when you think of factory farming, right, and the cruelty cases that might ha happen on factory farms, instead of the actual system itself as a, as a business, you know, as a mega corporation being inherently violent to the local communities, to the workers and to the animals. But then some of these organizations have pinpointed individuals as scapegoats, many of whom, you know, do not speak English as a first language, do not have a lot of protections, like I was saying, have high, insanely high rates of PTSD and workplace issues, um, injuries. And so what, Leah's uh, chapter really points to is that if you're a vegan organization who has a very close relationship mm -hmm. and is pushing the carceral state, you really need to think about it. 
and 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 think through that and really you know try to cut off those ties if you're going to actually create impactful change uh, and what's really interesting is these are all things we were thinking about months ago right and this book came out and then we have the uprisings currently mm -hmm. and i feel like now these conversations are happening more often which is very wonderful a lot of organizations um, and, and nonprofits are thinking through how they can be an ally or an advocate to the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think this is really a good space to do so. Mm -hmm. I'm actually organizing an anti-carceral vegan webinar. I'm on the editorial board of the Activist Review, and we have some really great folks. Leah is gonna be there, but we also have Justin Marceau, who's a law professor, and then Lori Gruen, who's an eco-feminist, who's gonna be talking about anti-carceral veganism. Um, July 9th. And so it's, I think we're at a really good point where it's not just why should we care? I think we've moved past that. Thank God, because I'm tired of having those conversations. <laughs> um, but now we're actually like, how do we do this? And what does this mean? What does this look like in practice? Is this possible? And that's where the actual work can be done. I think also it's important um, to go back to, to the individual as well. Um, with regards to to um, really understanding um, how we're kept um, divided and um, why these pain systems exist, um, and basically, for example, with regards to to racism and and um, Black Lives Matter, you're not really going to be able to get anywhere if you don't actually understand the root issues, and um, it feels sometimes like white folks just want um black and brown people to just well give me the the easy answer like how do I fix this and there's no easy answer there's work there's so much work <laughs> um and the way that that I like to to describe it is um as black and brown people and indigenous people we don't actually get a break from our reality um so when I mean work I mean every single day and it starts with something as basic as an anti-racism course um, an, and anti-racism um, yeah basically um, and that's the other thing that I'm sick of, of hearing is people um, always like well I can't afford it or I can't take time or okay so you can't afford and uh, to not be racist oh so you can't afford to take time to not be racist so basically you're more comfortable um, with things just as they are and this is why we can peacefully protest um, and then we can you know basically march and just like we're seeing now all these issues are suddenly not popular anymore um, basically and what I mean is is sort of the media mm -hmm. takes the attention away and then the people forget and then it starts all over again and it's really a, a, a point in time where, especially with regards to um, the, the LGBTQI plus movement, um, with regards to to what can be done, is basically actually start doing the work. Um, start actually doing the work, and that means um addressing your own communities the people right next to you the people you live with the people who who you work with the people who you spend the most time with or even your neighbor or xyz but most importantly start with yourself because if you don't start with yourself then how are you going to change anything if you don't even know um what the system or what what those issues actually look like um because you don't actually experience them. So, um, and actually, um, so I have a lighter, uh, I'm brown, but I have a lighter, lighter um, skin privilege. And so I exist in this uh, weird space um, where basically I see my, my role um, in this um, as a way to, to sort of lessen um, the burden on, um, on uh, black and indigenous um, people, especially black people, and take some of that, that labor off of them. So when this all started, 
it's like every white person that knew a black person was like demanding or still demanding labor from them um and it's not just asking simple questions because every time that a white person asks us to to basically give them an answer with regards to our experiences it's 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 exhausting it's work it's it's literally asking us to not only expose um, our experiences but also expose ourselves to your reaction <laughs> Um, and a lot of white people don't even realize that they have this like reaction um, that that goes along with all that. So I'm apart from the books, I, I actually just started working on an anti-racism course because I feel that this is also a way um, for me to to help during this time. But I wanted to make sure that that. Um, outside of these huge um, issues that, that are so important that people remember also to come back to the individual um, and what you can do um, within your space. Thanks, y'all, for, for taking my questions. I think this would actually be a great time um, to pivot over and see if other folks who are in the conversation um, have questions or comments that they'd like to contribute. Um, uh, yeah, so the way that this will work is if you want to uh, poke me via the comments box or alternately there's a bunch of different like reactions that you can use um, uh, within the Zoom software to kind of like raise your hand or get attention. So if there's one of those and you want to click on them, um, that'll like flag you for me to look at. However you want to do it, um, grab my attention. I will unmute you if that's a thing that you want and you can ask a question or share a comment. It would be awesome to bring some additional voices in tonight. Um, and while we're waiting for people to maybe like collect their thoughts on that, um, I guess uh, if, if y'all have any, any other thoughts about the book or the process of putting it together um, that you'd want to share, or perhaps I, I heard a little bit about future projects from both of you, which I have to say sounded really exciting. Um, if there's anything else along those lines, would also love to hear more about that. I feel like both Julie and I just never stop, right? We do so much all the time. <laughs> what, what are you working on right now, Julia? <laughs> oh my God, what am I not working on right, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and I get myself in trouble because I'm like, oh, I never messaged this person about that thing. <laughs> And like, I suddenly remember it and then I'm like, oh, we should do this. And then they agree to it. But then I'm like, oh no, because I still have to finish all these things. <laughs> and like, but like, okay, but I'll do the next part and I'll email the other person to get that started. Um, and, and I feel um, a sense of, I guess, urgency. Cause like, I, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm like in this, in this place where I see everything happening and I experience a lot of it, but I know that that's um, like, for example, black folks experience things a lot worse um, than I do um, based on um, colorism, for example. And, um, and I mean like full, um, uh, fully black group um, that mix, but um, and I just have this urgency um, to do something all the time because I think about life and and in my head I literally have no concept of time, which is weird. <laughs> but in my head, like time is or life is short because it's only like okay. So my relatives tend to live till they're a hundred. But to me, that's like, oh my God, a hundred years. I have like probably less than that. <laughs> like, so I need to do as much as possible. And I have no excuse um, because what, what's the point? Like, what else am I going to do? And of course, like there's other things that I should be doing um, and that I need to do. Um, and, and so I think that's what keeps me going all the time. And also my brain never stops. So <laughs> it's like, I get all these ideas or I'll like 
suddenly make all these connections and then I'll need to do this or not. But at any one time, I think I have like five books that are have written um, that are in like some kind of stage. Then um, we're, we're, um, we're really low budget. Um, so with regards to, to translating books, um, that's like some of them are done, but need um, line editing. Uh, some of them need to be fully started, like um, the queer and trans voices, but it's it's going to happen. But then due to my neurodivergence, um, I actually have a reading disability. And then I start thinking like, well, I'm ex I'm excluding people that are just like me because of the way, because of the format. So I also want to do something with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of people ask for audiobooks. Actually, yeah, because yeah, yeah. they're dyslexic and they can't get through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to, to figure out um, how to how to do the audiobook, but how to also do like the formatting that that because um, I in my, the way that I can read is if I see the text, but also hear it at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't really exist unless I like whatever, time it. Um, but it all takes money and like and obviously I I just so I do as much as I can with whatever I have um, but there's always projects and always things I want to do and um, and then there's the side projects because I feel every book has a side project <laughs> a new pride flag <laughs> zero ableism <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, and then all the books, yeah, like especially yeah. this one's all the profit. Oh, you know, all the the book sell, selling um is all going to go to trans women of color, right? So like, then we're also setting up how to do that kind of mutual aid, direct action kind of stuff. Um, and then Julie and I are also both working on separate chapters for a book with Anthony Ocella on eco ability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I started the the anti racism course, mm -hmm. and I'm hosting. A, I got kicked out of Cornell University um, <laughs> for complaining about racism, um, yeah. and trying to hold them accountable for it. So they literally just kicked me out. So I'm actually hosting a workshop on how to get kicked out of an Ivy League university, um, and it's basically actually a course for black brown indigenous people um and basically teaching them um about the system and and how really it's in, in it's set up to to silence us and punish us and it's things that we know but sort of we're so we're, we're constantly being gaslit um so you know this but you're kind of like no that could and then you this whole process that I went through, and it's a workshop to to teach um, Black, Brown, Indigenous people how to document, how to um, what channels to use to protect themselves, and things like that, um, which is really important because with my experience with what happened at Cornell, I spoke to so many um, uh, people of color that that had similar experiences, and and also even um, neurodivergent people who who have basically face discrimination and when it's happening you're in this space that you just don't know exactly where to go first and um so anyway that's the idea behind that so i'm doing the anti-racism course the workshop um and oh my God. <laughs> and of course and i have two small kids so <laughs> and with the pandemic i actually have to do homeschooling so <laughs> Yeah, I don't know anyone with kids is getting anything done. I have PhD friends who are working from home and teaching classes, and I'm so in awe. Um, for me, I have a collection on Queer Appalachia that I'm really excited about that is going to be published by PM Press. Um, the manuscript is going to be done in about a, a two months, and then we're going to start pitching it. Uh, so that's really exciting. It has all really wonderful voices. Of course, Samoan of Queer Appalachia is going to be in it. Um, and then a lot of other activists and organizations, Appalachian Goods Pipelines, um, BioBell Queers, they're all represented there. And then I also am working, I have research interests on Korea politics, which is like protests themselves as a form of public art, and then socially engaged art. So I've been working on collections with those um, that are in the early stages. And then I'm really also interested in activist history. 
And so we've been, Activist History Review has been working on two publications to, uh, about how to write activist history, how to create academic writing for a popular audience, and why historians should care about activism and how, how telling history is in itself an activist process. You know, think of all the lies you were told in school and then having to unlearn all of that, right? Um, so that's kind of what I've been working on lately. Uh, the, the other thing that, that um, Sanctuary Publishers will actually release, like the, the next book is a children's book and I'm really excited about it. because it's, it's called um, What Every Child Should Know. And it's written by uh, Tekka Lark, who was interviewed in um, Stacey Russo's book. Um, um, and she's incredible. Her writing is amazing. Um, and she's a, an early childhood um, educator, uh, writer. And it's basically a book that will be really important to, to POC, especially um, when you look at the, the, in, the um, inequality even within um, printing books or not printing books, but like book publishing. And there are more animal, non-human animal characters in books than there are people of color. Um, mm. So you can imagine um, what. Mm. Oh, and, and I actually read recently that even um, queer books are mostly written by straight people, um, <laughs> uh, which as you guess is the same for, for people of color. So I'm really grateful to be at this point where I could actually raise the voices of, of um, also black um, authors. And um, so, so that's one of our, our um, next projects. I'm really excited to see that um, and to be able to stock it here at our bookstore. Yes. <laughs> um, so I have not gotten any questions from folks. People are being very shy. Oh wait, possibly somebody maybe added one. Um, cool. So I'm just I'm skimming through that. Uh, da, 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 da. There's a, a a really long, great comment um, here, which oh. doesn't indicate that the commenter wants to speak directly. So I'll read it out loud. Um, uh, Henry, if you wanted to to say this in your own voice, please add another comment to let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that you wanted this shared. Um, so this comment just says. Oh wait, Henry here. Uh, oh yes, I can. Great. Okay, cool. I'm gonna um, unmute Henry here, and we'll bring in another voice to the conversation, if that's okay. Was there something you wanted to add, Julia? No. You're good. Okay, great. All right, cool. Here we go. Uh, yes. So I am shy. <laughs> um, Same. So, <laughs> so I, I sort of wrote some of my thoughts down, so I wouldn't be so so extra shy, but. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for creating this space. Um, I'll just, I'll read what I wrote. It'll make it easier. Uh, I said that the, the struggle of veganism is really at the center, connecting all of the other struggles for liberation. And it's something that I've really come to in my heart and been advocating for, you know, in the people in my life. But I've never seen anybody else acknowledge or discuss it outside of that. So it's just it's just amazing and you know it's it's been something that i felt really frustrated about you know not feeling like there's a space for that and that um like uh that the work <laughs> the work for so many different human liberation struggles have been led and conducted in a vacuum like you guys were mentioning the vacuum of white privilege and that there's just so much to be said about that and explored and um i haven't read your book i'd love Love too, and I'm sure it's much more explored in there. Um, but yeah, I just I'm really appreciative, and it feels um, it's very life giving to have this space um, and be able to see myself and other people. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in that, uh, you know, that feeling. Um, yeah, I said that giving these marginalized places a space is leading edge. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> that means the world. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for for sharing. 
and I, I agree that it is a real, a real blessing to have, have a space like this and to have um, folks like um, Zane and Julia um, uh, working to bring these voices together. And I, I already dropped a link in, um, uh, but I'll do it again uh, into the comments. Um, you can find a link both to um, the book we're discussing tonight, but also more of Julia's work, which I think is really just essential reading. Um, and I would encourage everybody to check out the Sanctuary Publishers website, read these books. They are absolutely essential for anyone who is concerned with human and non-human uh, animal liberation. Um, did anybody else have a comment or a question um, to, to add into this evening? I don't wanna close us out early if, if anybody else is sitting on something that, that maybe they're, they're working on how to, how to put into words. I want to say, like, I know we're, we're, oh, sorry. Hey. <laughs> Go ahead, Julia. Oh, I was going to say that I know that, that it seems like, um, oftentimes we're, we're alone. Um, but I, I feel that times are changing and I think people are starting to realize that they're missing something. <laughs> so, um, especially with regards to, to white privilege, if you are a white person, then you definitely should be using that privilege. Um, because the thing that they don't tell you is that it's, it's literally a superpower. And when I mean superpower, I mean in the way that, that the privilege is used to um, oppress people like me, but you can actually use it to undo the system. Um, I can't do that. Um, POC can't do that on our own. So we're actually waiting for you <laughs> to, <laughs> to recognize that you literally have the ability um, to turn things around. So if you want to hear um, or, or uh, help spread um, the, these uh, ideals and, and to help the movement go a different way, then you have to make noise. You can't just wait for it to happen on its own um, because it's not. And I can tell you that my experiences working by myself and with Zane have been like night and day. <laughs> like um, just even with the with actually getting responses from from people and places that I've written consistently since 2017, and then suddenly it's like, oh hello. <laughs> So um, literally, when I talk a lot about raising voices, and that's just something that you can all do so easily. Um, and when I say easily, I, I really mean easily compared to, to um, the amount of work and the struggles and the tears and the pain that we have to go through um, for basically like a little, little thing. <laughs> So, um, yeah, make more noise. Um, uh, and I know that a lot of us are shy and, um, and not just shy of anxiety. And, and as you can tell, I'm, I, I struggle with um, organizing my thoughts because my brain is always like, <laughs> um, but I have faith in, in all of us in that, that um, we can actually create change and hopefully faster than it has been happening. Um, and I, I've actually seen the change. I've been vegan for, for over 12 years, um, 12 and a half years, and, and I've seen changes, but it's, it's so slow, y'all. Like, <laughs> I have to move it up. There's no more time. <laughs> I, I, I can't keep waiting. We can't keep waiting. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this has been a real pleasure. Um, and I just want to again um, thank everybody for um, joining in uh, for this, this evening session, this conversation that is so needed. Um, 
yeah, I hope, I hope as y'all go out into the world, you take these ideas with you, um, that you pick up the books, that you continue to do the work, um, to explore, uh, to educate yourself. Um, and, uh, yeah. As thank we sign you off. So yep. yeah, thank you so much for, for having us and, and to everyone that, that, um, tuned in. Um, I'm really grateful that, that you took the time and, and, uh, Thank you again for, for supporting Sanctuary Publishers. And, and yeah, this has been really wonderful. It's, it's always fun to talk, you know, to folks that you know are all on the same page. And I get so passionate about it, and it just warms my heart that, um, you know, some folks might be able to see themselves in the work that I was uh, able to be part of. And that's just really wonderful for me. So thank you. Awesome. Well, y'all, I hope everybody has a great night and, uh, you know, check out our calendar at firestorm.coop. Um, we do uh, try and host events like these regularly. Um, and honestly, we've been able to just have some great conversations despite the, the challenges of the digital medium. Um, so please do take a peek and see what we've got coming up. Um, I will just go ahead and name specifically that there's a conversation that I think will be um, a good a good one for folks who are here for it on July 9th. Uh, that's a Thursday evening, also at 8 p.m. Uh, we will be hosting um, one of the authors of uh, Police, a Field Guide um, for an event called The Caretakers of Violence, um, which is going to uh, look at some of these conversations that we started to have tonight and like talk a little bit more about abolition um, and a little bit more about policing. Um, and I think it would be awesome to have some, uh, some queer vegan voices uh, in that conversation. So please do plan to join us again for that um, on July 9th. And on that note, uh, we'll sign off for tonight. Thank you all so much. Bye y'all, thank you. Thank you.